Marco Arnaldo, Marnaldo um, makes a lot of different videos explaining how to play games. I found them quite useful myself, and I think a lot of other people have as well. So when he requested that um, my review of In the Shadow of the Empire, Emperor, explain how to play the game, um, I I thought I should I should try to make a video that explained how to play the game because my review really doesn't. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to go step by step kind of going through the phases, talking about each um, individual part of the game, and hopefully um, shed some light on how to play it. Because the rule book, I admit, is unclear. I had to do some research to figure out um, exactly what the rules are. I still could be wrong, however. I've had no one check me on this. So um, those of you who know the game, if I've gotten something wrong, please feel free to uh, leave a comment. Um, just so that people who are other people who are watching the video don't make the same mistakes I have made. Okay, hope you enjoy. All right, so here we have the board semi set up to start the game. Um, I'll just talk about the different parts, going from up here to over here, and then back this way. All right, so here we have our Thaler track. This is how the players keep track of money. I'll be going over what how you do that in just a little bit. Um, up top we have the emperor track and also turn track so whoever is the emperor is going to have their emperor piece right in this space right here um, at the end of all the phases this will move forward making another turn um, there are five turns to the game these images here these icons tell you what the what the emperor's special privileges are that turn so as you can see the first two turns the emperor gets a better privilege and then as the game goes on what the emperor gets is lessened. All right. Though actually, third turn is pretty good too. Kind of that whole cycle thing. All right. So here we have our victory point cards. Pretty straightforward. Main meat of the game is going to happen right here. And there, there are seven. These are our seven electorates. These top three are holy electorates. These bottom four are secular electorates. They kind of have some different rules um, associated with them. The main one being holy electorates can only um, be held by a, a single person. They can, couples cannot hold them because since they're holy, they're not allowed to be married because marriage is unholy. Um, there's also some certain card effects that affect one and not the other and vice versa. We'll go over that in the action phase. So this is, this is where all the action happens. Most of the action happens and this is also the main way that players get points is by taking control of an electorate. So we'll go through the phases now, starting with the Thaler track. Here we have the red player at game start on the Thaler track. Um, we have their color, the red player's color chip and their scoring marker. Really, both of these pieces aren't necessary to play the game. Um, the color chip, as far as I understand, is just a placeholder for how much, how much money you start the turn with. And then as you purchase action cards, you move the marker down. So that's basically it. If I play a card that costs two coins, I go one, two, and you, keep, you leave that alone. This only changes at the beginning of the, uh, during the income phase. All right, here we have a rather simple setup to demonstrate the income phase of the game. So, we're, scoring, we're figuring out Red's income right now. So first thing we do is we count Red's red cities. He has one. And then we can count um, cities of other colors that are in electorates that red controls. There's one of those. So that's one, two. And then if red controls the Saxony of Saxony Duchy, um, he gets an additional two. So that's one, two, three, four. We add that to a base of eight or a base of six and we get ten. Right? Uh, if red had begun the turn with two two left, say, Red had two left that he hadn't spent the previous turn, uh, you would get to add that as well. So you'd have two, three, four, five, six, plus six is twelve, and that's the most you can have. If Red were to start off with three, for example, and then add the other eight, or not the other eight, the other ten, it would still only get twelve. Twelve is the most you can start a turn with. Next is the aging phase, and it's fairly simple, but there are a couple things to keep in mind. So to age your guys, you basically just turn them one space clockwise. 
so that they go up one. If they're already at 45, they go away. Now this this um, this Baron of the Marquisette of Brandenburg does not get replaced. That's one way you can recapture the same electorate over and over again is if you if you time the cycle of your age so that you have a 45 year old there they can die and if you still have the majority of control you can bring another guy up. So Those don't get replaced. However, the Emperor when the Emperor ages out you do replace the Emperor from one of your your spots. Next is the Descendants phase um, and I'll just run over the, the three possible scenarios when it's your turn. Okay, Descendants is determined by the number of, uh, by the colors of the action cards you played in the previous phase. Um, special note, these first three phases are not done during the first turn. There's a particular setup you do to kind of get them all done in one um, move that's equal to every, equal for everyone. Um, we'll go over that later. Um, okay, so first one is if you have more blue cards than pink cards, you have a sun. Okay, red has more blue cards and pink cards in this scenario. Red gets a 15 year old boy to put wherever he wants. All right, put him in Bohemia. All right. Next scenario, you have more pink cards than blue cards. You're going to have a daughter. Okay, if you have a daughter, you have two choices. You can either offer your daughter in marriage to one of the other players, and they get you only get to choose one player and they get to decide to either accept or decline. If they accept, say I offered it to Blue, Blue could choose one of their their people to turn into a couple and that basically gives them another um, unit of control. That's what these towers mean in a province. And in return, you get a victory point if you are able to marry off your daughter. Now, your other option is to simply sell the daughter off for one Thaler um, which gives you another Thaler to spend. Um, also, if they decline your daughter in marriage, you also you default to the Thaler position. All right. The other, the other scenario is if you have an equal number of pink and blue cards. In that case, you also have a daughter because there's slightly more women in the world than men. All right. Next is the action phase. The action phase proceeds clockwise from the emperor, starting with the emperor as the first player. Um, each player on their turn, and there can be several turns or phases in the action, or turns in the action phase. Uh, basically, players keep keep going, taking turns in the action phase until everyone's passed. All right. So the the first thing and the main thing you're going to do during the action phase is purchase and play action cards. And I'll talk about what each of those do in a moment. Next thing you can do is do the power of your electorate. And I'll also talk about that in a moment. Third thing you can do, kind of is an action card, is place and move a knight. The only difference between that and the other action cards is you can always do it. There is nothing that prevents you from doing it. And it doesn't give you a blue or pink card. So it doesn't affect your descendants at all. All right, so here we have our action cards. I'll talk about what they all do. So starting with this one right here, this is the doctor. And the doctor can either be used to increase the health of your people or to poison the other people. So um, if I were to buy the doctor card, I would pay one Thaler, which means I would move my, my Thaler marker down on the Thaler track, keep the card in order to, to record it for descendants in the, in the future, and then I would either take one of my guys, say if my guy was 25 and I wanted him to be younger, I could turn him to 15, or I could take one of the other player's people and make them older. So they either poison or they heal. That's the doctor. Next card is the movement card, and they basically let you move one of your people from one electorate to another. And again, you take and you keep the card for descendants. Then you have, what's this card called? Um, this is the, it gives you a victory point, that's what it does. It's called the, help if I have the, it's the indulgence, I really like that name. Um, indulgence gives you a victory point, again you keep the card. Then we have the three blue voting related cards. These all affect the um, emperor election and some of them are a little tricky, so this might be a part that's not evident from the rules. I, I had to research some of them. So this first one, well, we'll go with the easiest. This is the Pope. The Pope gives you an extra vote in the Emperor election. 
Then we have the excommunication. This only works on secular electorates, so only the bottom four on the board. doesn't affect these at all. And what it does is it um, disallows their vote in the emperor election. So the secular electorates are each going to have one vote except for the Kingdom of Bohemia, which has two. If you, um, if you get this card, you can determine one of them not to vote. Um, all right, and the third one is the church influence, and this is the kind of trickier one. Now, how the church influence works, and it only works on the um, religious electorates, is you get to count one vote per knight or nobleman in one of the spiritual electorates, in the religious electorates. So, um, if, if I purchase this card for two, I would get four votes in my main diocese. diocese. Um, so it, it, can be a, it can be a very useful card. It can also tip your hat if you're, um, tip your hand, not your hat, tip your hat to tipping your hand if you happen to be um, a rival or you have aspirations to be a rival. All right. So now let's look at the pink cards. First we have this one. This one allows you to build a city. Basically you take this card, you can build a city. Cities um, are your main economic engine and they also, you get a victory point for your first city, a victory point for your second city, and two victory points for your third city. So they're worth four points total if you, if you build all your cities. They're kind of expensive um, and they also allow you um, a unit of control in whichever, um, whichever electorate they're in. So if I'm in Bohemia, and it's time to decide on a new elector. Let's say I have two cities and a nobleman, and they just have this couple, which is worth two. I would win like so. Um, here we have this card. I can't remember where I lost where I put the thing that tells me what the cards are called. Anyway, this is the one that lets you buy a new, a new um, noble person or couple. If you spend three coins, Three Thaler, you can put a new 15-year-old somewhere. If you spend five, you can put a 15-year-old young, young couple somewhere. Like so. Three, five. All right. Then we have the, the promotion card. I got to get that. I'm going to stop it so I can find the, the list. All right, that was right. It was called the promotion card. This basically, you spend two coins and you can turn your knight into a noble person. Like so, 15 year old, no matter how old the knight is, no matter how many turns the knight has been in play, they come in as a 15 year old. Pretty great, pretty great. Um, this goes here. Okay, then we have the Brandenburg card. That's a special one for the Marquisette of Brandenburg. So I'll wait until I talk about their privileges to tell you what the Brandenburg card is. It's a card though, um, so it does, affect, um, it does affect your children, your descendants. All right, the final action card is the rival card, and this one's a pretty special card. It is, you, you can tell it's gray. It doesn't affect your descendants. If you decide to take this card, and, and only the people who aren't the emperor may take it, your turn is, your action phase is done. You can take no more actions during the action phase. Um, it costs nothing, and basically what this does is this positions you as the person who's going to run against the emperor in the next election. That's what it does. All right, so let's look at knights. Knights, um, you can place a coin to, or you can spend a, a Thaler to place a knight, or you can spend a Thaler to move a knight. Each player only has three knights, so sometimes it's better to move them, and sometimes they're, you don't want control of an of a electorate because you want someone else to take control. So um, knights can be put here, and you can put, you can put here. Um, good place for knights is in castles because they can't get pushed out. How pushing out works is say I have a knight there and blue wants to move in. There's no other space for blue to move so their noble people or person can just move the knight and the knight goes away. Um, so you want to be careful about placing knights in the last remaining space in an electorate. Alright, so you're also allowed to use um, some of the powers that are available to you. Any of these that say four can be used in this phase, um, the action phase, because the action phase is the fourth phase. So I'll talk about each of those um, 
We already talked about the Saxony Duchy. We'll talk about Mainz and Kingdom of Bohemia later, though they're not very complicated. Um, County Palatine of Rhine. Basically, when you want to use this action, you move this over here, and what it does is, say I didn't have this guy on here, I've, I've placed all my red nobles, um, you get to place a new 15-year-old. So it acts pretty much just like this card with the three three Thaler costs, except it costs you nothing. You just have to move it over to show that you've used it for the turn, <coughs> and then you can place a new 15-year-old. Try your diocese. Okay, if you, you do the same thing, you flip it over there, um, try your diocese lets you use any card that's already been run out. You still have to pay for it, but um, you can use it. So say the other three players or everyone's used up all the doctor cards. There's no more doctor cards left, and you would like to use the doctor card. You can flip over, pay your failure, and doctor it up. You know, make your emperor younger. Uh, make your opponent's couple older, just as though you played the doctor card. It doesn't affect descendants, however. Um, Colne Diocese acts like a doctor card. That's, that's all it does. Um, you put your guy over, you can make your opponent older or yourself younger. Uh, everyone's 15. Ah, okay. Doesn't have to be the one there, though. It could be, say, this guy's 35. You can make him 25. All right. And... Oh, Marquis de Brandenburg. Marquisette of Brandenburg. This one is the um, trickiest. Basically, when you flip over, you don't do the action right away. You get to... Oh, no. Yeah, you get the card. And the card you use at the end of the action phase, I believe. Um, and there's a misprint in this gray eminence card. Okay, this is the card you get from the, the Marquisette of Brandenburg. And it says at the, the bottom here... This baron can become either an elector or the emperor. It should actually be neither an elector nor the emperor. The, the, the baron you place from the Marquisette of Brandenburg cannot be used um, to, to rule anything. What it can be done, and it starts at the beginning of phase five, which we're going to be talking about soon, um, is basically at the beginning of page, phase five, you can put the Marquisette of Brandenburg on any electorate, and it basically just gives you another unit of control. Um, the reason why you, I, I believe you use a piece, uh, an actual piece, a 45-year-old piece, rather than just um, rather than just saying I have an extra uh, control unit there, is because if you've got all your barons out, you can't actually use the card. So it's nice if you're in, if you're in a tie. Um, if you're in a tie here, and you have the, at the beginning of phase five, Marcus set to Brandenburg, Saxony Duchy's mine. Great. Way to go, red player. Let's talk about phase five, the new elector phase. First thing that's going to happen is if um, someone has the gray eminence card, they're going to be able to play their gray eminence. We kind of talked about that already. Um, to add to a location. All right. Um, Second thing that would happen is you go through each electorate and you determine who gets control. So let's start with the kingdom of, let's start with some, somewhere simpler than the kingdom of Bohemia. Okay, Marcus said of Brandenburg. Um, th there are a few things that give you control. All right, there are cities, there are nobles, and there are knights. All right, so if blue has a, a city there, blue has three control called power points in this game. Red has one. Blue gets the Marcus head of Brandenburg and immediately takes two points. All right, pretty simple. Let's look at the Kingdom of Bohemia. Now here, red has more power points than blue. However, red is not able to take the Kingdom of Bohemia because red does not have a, a noble person in the Kingdom of Bohemia. Blue does not get to take it either, however, because blue has less power points. Kingdom of Bohemia, no one takes it, no one gets any points. All right, Saxony Duchy, here's pretty straightforward. Blue has more than red. Red will go down to the Saxony Duchy, and blue will go up. Get to choose anyone to go up. County Rhine of County Palatine of Rhine, red would take it. Has two power points versus blue's one from the city. Um, let's look at mains up here. Mains 
blue would take it with their single person. And then, oh, here's a good, good thing to point out. Uh, it's not clear in the rules, but the mains victory point, which is what the main mains does, is done at the end of phase five. So um, red started the turn in mains, right? Red does not get the victory point this turn. Blue would, because blue is the one who takes it over. So blue would end up picking up three for taking mains, essentially. Um, if red had held on to mains, we will make it make it so that happens. Red would still get red would get the victory point, but just one. All right, here Coln. No one gets Coln because blue has two power points. No one else has any, but blue's power points are from a couple, and the couple is ineligible to become a Coln elector. Finally, Trier. Um, Trier is won by yellow, and the reason why is Trier has an imperial city in it. Um, and I actually have that upside down. <laughs> Trier has an imperial city in it. Now, the imperial city um, gets to be placed by the emperor as one of the emperor's special privileges. Um, I'll explain that later. Um, it blocks the coin, blocks the thaler, so you don't get, you don't get any money for having an imperial city, but you do get uh, a unit of control. So Trier would go there. Now, say this city wasn't there and these two were tied. I would say likely that yellow would still get it, and here is why. Ties are determined by the emperor, which is actually quite a strong power in this game in terms of um, deciding control, and the emperor is probably going to decide in favor of him or herself. Um, so yellow would still take it if they were tied. Now, if, say, blue and red were tied down here, it's just up to yellow's whim, and here's a place where they could maybe curry some favor for the upcoming vote. And that's basically how votes happen. Mains gets the point at the end of the round. All right, next comes the election phase, and it's really pretty simple. Each player is going to have one of these cards that on one side has this symbol, which is the emperor's symbol. Uh, the emperor gets a piece just like this that they get to keep in their play area. Or this symbol, which is the rival symbol. Whoever is the rival this turn has already taken this card, so it's pretty clear. Um, the emperor automatically votes for the emperor, and the rival automatically votes for the rival. Everyone else is going to put, you know, have hidden what they chose, and then they're going to reveal what they chose. And that's pretty much it. Um, all of one person's votes go to whoever they choose. So if blue, since we kind of have a three-person game, a very unlikely three-person game set up here, um, blue would, and red has the rival card, blue is the only one who's actually going to vote, um, have, a, have an active decision in voting. And all of blue's votes are going to go for who they chose. So say blue chose the rival, which is more likely than not, I think, um, all of blue's votes would go to the rival. Now. How many votes does a person get? Well, they get one for each electorate they have. So blue right now has one, one. Um, and we'll, we'll, let's, for, for fun, say blue also has the kingdom of Bohemia. Um, blue would actually get two votes. See these two fingers here? That means the kingdom of Bohemia's powers, it gets two votes, not just one. All right, so blue would have three for that. If blue also had the Pope card, Blue would have four votes there. And let's say, we already kind of explained this card, but since it kind of takes place in this phase, we'll, exp we'll do it here too. See so if blue also had the church influence card and the Coln diocese, diocese, blue would have three more votes. One, two, three, there. So that gives blue one, two, three, four, five, six votes. However, this oftentimes happens, especially if you think someone's going to vote against you as the Kingdom of Bohemia. Yellow has this card, um, decides that the Kingdom of Bohemia is not allowed in this vote. Blue would then have one, two, three, four, five. All players who voted for uh, the victor, who are not either the emperor or the rival, um, get a victory point if they chose right, so to speak. 
So blue in our example, if the, if the rival was the one who won and blue voted for the rival, uh, blue would get a victory point. Um, the only other thing to note about elections for emperor is that if there's a tie, the emperor remains the emperor. The final two phases are, um, I'm just going to talk to you about real quickly because they're very simple. First, whoever um, is the emperor at the end of uh, the election phase gets to do what's what's said what it says in the little insignia here it says they get two victory points and they get a place in imperial city that's their their advantage if the marker were here same thing if the marker were here they would get two points a thaler and they would get to move a city which is pretty nice um here they get a victory point and two thalers here they get one victory point so after they do what it says here and um then the round marker moves. All right, so whoever's the emperor at the end of the first round gets this special bonus. Whoever's emperor at the end of the second round gets this bonus, and so on. Well, there you go, Marnaudo and his friends. My battery's about to run out, and um, I hope this was helpful. Uh, it was actually oddly enjoyable to, to make this instructional video. It wasn't, I wouldn't say it was fun, um, but for how boring I'm sure it turned out it was um, enjoyable to do, to try to, to describe a game. I do enjoy teaching games. Um, I'm used to doing it in person, however, it's very different to do it uh, for a camera because a camera can't nod its head to show understanding or um, ask questions. But hopefully that was helpful. If anything was unclear, feel free to ask me. Um, I'm by no means an expert in this game. And I want to reiterate anyone who is, feel free to leave comments about what I might have gotten wrong in my explanation because the goal here is to, to teach. So let's teach each other.